Well, good evening. Glad that you've decided to join us this Good Friday night. I want to start off with a passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 5. The Bible says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a, a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I'm Pastor Brad Smith of Grace Community Church in Battle Creek, uh, and we've intentionally decided to set some time apart this evening to think about, to meditate upon what Christ did for us on that Good Friday, his crucifixion, his death for our sin, that we can be reconciled to a holy God. That's the heart of the gospel. The question is, how can a sinful people be right with a holy and righteous God who must punish sin or else compromise his righteousness and his holiness? Well, the answer to that question is found in Good Friday. And again, that's the heart of the gospel. Christ died for the sins of all who believe so that we can be right with God, so that our sin was paid for on the cross of Christ that day. We're going to have some songs. We have um, uh, Kevin obviously leading in some hymns again. And then we'll be in Matthew chapter 27, looking at verses 32 through 44. And we're really going to think about uh, how they, some people, responded as Christ was being crucified. There are seven different ways that we're going to discuss that people honestly were mocking the grace of God as Christ was dying on the cross on that Friday. And what we want to do is to analyze our own hearts and our own lives and make sure that we're not uh, tempted to follow any of those bad examples or follow into that trap as well. So again, we're glad that you joined us on this Good Friday. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the opportunity just to meditate upon your goodness and your grace and the gospel. We're thankful for the death of Christ. We're thankful that sin has been punished and therefore can be forgiven by your glorious grace. Pray that this would be a sweet time of worship wherever we may find ourselves on this evening. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Come and die 
love for us how vast beyond all men that he should give his only son and make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face His wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in 
in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Well, if you'll turn in your Bibles now to Matthew chapter 27, this evening we'll be looking at verses 32 through 44. Matthew 27, verses 32 through 44. I think that there's a danger when we think about the crucifixion story yet again. I think that there can be a danger that it's that because it's such a well-known story, that because it is so familiar to us, it can then in our minds be seen as kind of common or, or inconsequential, and that's certainly not the case. So what I want to do this evening is look at seven different ways in which people really mocked the grace of God as Christ was being crucified on that Friday, and then make sure as we think about those ways that we're not allowing those things to, to slip into our thinking as well. So the question really is, when, when we come to this Good Friday, when we think about the cross of Christ and the death of Christ again, how do we respond? And again, we want to make sure that we're not tempted to respond in any of these seven ways that would reflect poorly upon uh, our, our intentionality or our understanding of the cross of Christ. But let's go ahead and read through these verses together. Matthew 27, beginning at the 32nd verse, gives Matthew's account of the crucifixion. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So here we see the moment of Christ's crucifixion. Very different responses to what was happening at the time. The first one in verse 34, we can see they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. Now, gall was actually a very bitter herb. It was a poisonous herb, so to speak. So this can be an example in this verse of people who respond to the cross of Christ by pretending a, a kindness and offering a gift or making an offering of some sort to him. But really, it's mixed with wickedness. Their, their true intent is seen by the fact that it is not a pure kindness. It is not a Christ-centered kindness. It's actually backhanded in such a way that it would be intended to do harm. So as we think about the cross of Christ and as we think about the crucifixion and the gospel itself, or is, is our response one that it's just pretending to be important to us, that, it's, that, that our worship is, is kind of feigned worship, while at the other hand we're, we're going to be continuing to live for self and to do what we want to do in a way that really minimizes what Christ is doing? See, and then verse 5, we come to a second response. 
In verse 35, it says, And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And you know that that's actually fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. But for our sake, number two, it can be seen as an example of, of giving to Christ or going to Christ to get stuff. You see, as Christ was crucified, there were those who responded to that crucifixion by just seeing what they could get out of it. This is a self-centered response to the gospel or a self-centered response to the crucifixion. These would be those who, who come to Christ or come to religion or come even to church, to the people of God, because they want something from them. They're not offering worship. They're not offering devotion. Uh, they're just selfishly seeking what they could get out of it. And this thinking can actually be perpetuated by the many false gospels that are that are prevalent in our day to day. If you've heard of the prosperity gospel or the health, wealth and prosperity gospel is some term it. That's a that's a false gospel that really has at its core a selfish mindset that says if you would just pray this prayer, if you would just jump through these religious hoops, then you could get what you want from God, as if you could force his hand in some way. So so for them, seeking Christ is actually just a means to a selfish, self-centered end of, of uh, doing what they want to do. That's another way in which the gospel of Christ and the cross of Christ can be mocked. Now, number three in verse 36, it says that there are some who are the same group. Then it says they sat down and kept watch over him there. See, there are some who respond to the cross of Christ, number three, by just watching and waiting, but with absolutely no commitment. Again, treating Christ as if he's, as if he's some sort of novelty to be uh, pondered, but really not one that has any right to make demands on, on their lives. These are those who actually were pretending as if Jesus hadn't done enough to reveal to them who he really is, as if the Old Testament promises and prophecies weren't enough to point people to Christ. So they respond, maybe not with apathy, maybe with just feigned curiosity, but that's as far as it goes. They were certainly not turning to Christ in faith and belief. They were certainly not turning to Christ with any kind of faith that would save. So we need to make sure that our response is not just one of, of gazing upon the cross again as if it's a, a novel kind of act in history, but one that really doesn't make demands of our life, because the opposite is the truth. The reality is that God dying on the cross for his people makes demands of us. It's a demand clearly to repent and to believe and to submit to Christ and to cry out to him as Savior and Lord. Look at verse 37 now. It says, They had put over his head the charge that was against him, and the charge that was against him was, was the claim. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So they're, obviously they've made that claim against him as, as kind of a mockery. They're rejecting that claim. That's a sarcastic comment. He's being crucified because he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And, and in having that posted there, it's really kind of the, the indictment of, of their condemnation saying clearly he's not king of the Jews or he wouldn't be being crucified here right now. So we see in this, this fourth uh, mockery of God's grace is just an overt rejection of the kingship of Christ. Now, it's, it's a little more subtle today as this thinking creeps into the, into the churches. If you've been around uh, church doctrine or, or Christian debate the last couple of decades, maybe you've heard of the controversy over the lordship of Christ or lordship salvation. And, and what that really was about was whether or not you could submit to Christ as Savior without submitting to him as Lord. You see, and obviously, clearly, we would say you can't. He's, he is Savior and Lord. He is not Savior or Lord. And the reality is he's Lord of the universe. He's Lord of all that is, whether we recognize it or not. But there are those who were rejecting his kingship. They were rejecting his right to rule over them. And unfortunately, even in today's culture, Christian culture, there are those who are clearly rejecting the teaching of Scripture and the teaching of Christ. This is a rejection of his kingship. 
If we mistakenly think that we can turn to Christ as Savior and then not have to submit to him as Lord, we're wrong. And we're making the same mockery of the gospel and of God's grace that they were making back in that day when they crucified him and then posted that, uh, again, that, uh, that sign which was clearly derogatory and a rejection of his kingship. So the question for us is, have you truly submitted to him as, as not only Savior, but King of your life? Have you submitted to his authority as the right to rule over our family, as he has good and graciously provided for even our eternity? Skip ahead to verse 39, and let's look at the fifth way in which God's grace is mocked here. Verse 39, it says, And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. It's interesting to note that, uh, again, the claims of Christ were widely known. They knew that he had claimed uh, to come back. They knew that he had claimed to be the son of God. But for our purposes, the fifth kind of attitude that mocks the grace of God is just giving the cross of Christ, giving the crucifixion and the work of God on our behalf, a passing glance. It's kind of the, the condemnation based upon preconceived notions. You see, those who were walking past the cross on that day and deriding him kind of from afar just as they were moving beyond it, it appears never truly stopped to consider the claims of Christ. You see, the work of God in the world or their preconceived notions seemed so far-fetched to them that they never seriously considered it. And in just giving Christ a passing glance, they're, they're heaping their vitriol and their condemnation upon the Savior of the world. So we need to make sure as well as we're thinking about what Christ has accomplished for us on this Good Friday, that, that it takes a weightier position in our life than just giving a, a passing glance to. Look at verse 41, and we'll come to our sixth example here. Verse 41, we see that the chief priests with the scribes and elders, they mock Christ and they say, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God now deliver him if he desires him. For he said, I'm the son of God. Again, we see clearly that they understood the claims that Christ was making. They understood Christ was claiming a position of authority. Christ was claiming to be a son of God. Now, there's a couple actually here that could be combined into this point. But, but for our purposes, we see uh, number six, the religious and spiritual people, those who were pretending to be religious and spiritual at least, yet they rejected God. They rejected the truth of God. And then they so ended out mocking God with all of the other unbelievers. It's interesting to note too here that in these verses, they seem to make a demand of God. You see, him, you see them say, let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Think about the arrogance of a, of a human attitude or philosophy that believes that it has the right to make a demand of Almighty God and then says, if you do what I demand of you, then I will believe, again, as if God hasn't done enough. So they say that, first of all, if, if, if you want me to believe in you, then you have to do what I think you should do. Come down from the cross and then I'll believe. You see, there are those who are, who are very spiritual, and we, again, see this so widely in our culture today with uh, New Age theology, New Age philosophy, or, or spirituality that clearly rejects the kingship of Christ, the, the claim that Jesus is uniquely the Son of God, God in the flesh, and rejects the claim that Jesus did anything efficacious or effective on the cross on that Good Friday. You see, it's not that our culture has a problem with spirituality or, or even the spiritual realm in many cases. Uh, the problem is that there are those who mock the grace of God by overtly rejecting Jesus as the Son of God and our Savior. That leads to number seven, at least to the last uh, example of mocking grace that we'll talk about this evening. And that's the 44th verse. And the robbers who were crucified with him 
also reviled him in the same way. They kind of heaped on just like everybody else was doing. See, this is the this is the the falsehood. This is the error of assuming that Jesus is just like us. See, they they assumed at that time, we know that one of them later believes and is saved, but at that time they assumed that Jesus was just like them. He was being crucified just as as a man who was crucified as they were being crucified. But that's that's a horrendous error in assuming that there's nothing particularly unique about Jesus the Christ. And this is why I know that it may be an overreaction, but this is why I reject so vehemently against uh, all the language and the prayers and the, some of the curriculum and the t-shirts that are posted out there that, that make Jesus kind of uh, on par with us. You know, Jesus is our friend. He says that the Bible says he calls us friend, but that doesn't mean he's just like us. It doesn't mean there isn't anything uniquely uh, divine about him. Absolutely, Jesus is, we would affirm, fully God and fully man, the only perfect human who has ever walked on this planet, the only one qualified to die for somebody else's sin. But instead of kind of looking up to God and submitting to God, we're tempted to, to try to drag God down and to place him on par with us. That's a horrific horrific error and one that I think at the at that point in time at least the robbers seem to have been committing well these are examples and these are negative examples these are warnings for us to make sure that when we think about the cross of Christ we're we're clear in our thinking and that even though it's a familiar story we don't come to think of it as overly familiar or overly common or or inconsequential we need to not lose the weightiness of what's happening or what was happening on that good friday still in matthew 27 if you skip ahead to the 51st verse the Bible says this, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. In the moment of Christ's death, there were many signs that were given. And I've actually preached on this before in years previously, but there are many signs that were given at the moment of Christ's death. One of them was that the curtain in the temple, that which separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, that which separated, that curtain which separated the, the place where God's presence was most fully seen or symbolized in the Holy of Holies, and what separated that from the rest of the temple. That curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, from heaven to earth because of God's divine initiative. And then because of the death of Christ, the gospel way was made where people through faith in Christ's work could then be reconciled to God. There's no dividing curtain any longer. Our sin, which had separated us from God, had been done away with. The price had been paid in full and then a sinful people forgiven by God and counted by righteous by God through faith in Christ can then be reconciled to God and experience the joy and the comfort and the peace and the contentment and the eternal security that comes from that. So on this Good Friday, what is your response? When we think again about the cross of Christ, do you, res do you respond rightly with, with worship, understanding, and seeking to comprehend the weightiness of what was taking place there, crying out to God in praise for having torn the curtain in two, making a way for us to be right with God? Or, or have we allowed some of these erroneous ways of thinking to kind of creep into our theology? We need to continue to battle against them. We need to continue to be a people quick to repent when we recognize this kind of thinking creeping into our theology and again confess on this Good Friday that it's only because of the grace of God and the work of Christ on our behalf that we have salvation and security and a surety of eternal life with God. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the work that you have done on our behalf. We're so thankful that through faith in Christ we can be counted as righteous Again, we confess that there's much mystery in this and we may not understand it all on this side of life. We're certainly not gonna understand it all, but we confess your, your hatred against sin and the seriousness with which we should take sin and battle sin in our own life. We confess that we see in Christ's death 
the consequence of our sin that, that we deserved. But we're so thankful that he died as our substitute, that through the substitutionary atonement of Christ, we can be saved and reconciled to you and experience the joy that comes from being in a right relationship with you. Father, we pray that this would be, regardless and despite the circumstances, we pray that this would be a sweet and fruitful season of growth and discipleship and evangelism and salvation uh, for your people. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner. Sing of his love. 